Um, welcome everybody. I'm Mirko Draka. I'm director of the Cage Research Center at Warwick. I'm really pleased uh, today to be chairing the Crafts Lecture, our second Nick Crafts, Crafts Lecture. Um, what I'll do as an introduction is tell you a bit about Nick and a bit about our speaker, Hans Joachim Voss, okay? Um, so Nick Crafts, my uh, predecessor is, as CAGE director. So uh, Nick has had this kind of long and illustrious career in, in British academic economics with positions, successive positions at Exeter, Warwick, Oxford, Leeds, Warwick, LSE, Warwick and Sussex. Okay, so he's frequently gone away from Warwick and come back to Warwick. Uh, amongst his honours that, that he's collected over his career, he's a fellow of the British Academy. Impressively, he has a 2014 CBE, that is, he is a commander of the British Empire, so he's commander crafts. Um, he's current president of the Royal Economic Society, okay? We can list all of these achievements, but I think it's much more informative and important to talk about the research contributions um, that, you know, the scholars that you know, we're thinking about today uh, have made. Um, Nick's research, I think you can summarize it as being focused on the economic history of the Industrial Revolution and quite importantly, how that economic history bears on economic performance today. I think some good examples of this type of research are, would be recent work he's done discussing the role of artificial intelligence as a general purpose technology in the context of sort of comparisons to previous uh, general purpose technologies like the steam engine. Um, only a few weeks ago, he produced a really interesting working paper as part of the CAGE working paper series on Keynes's prediction of a 15 hour work week and how that comes up to scratch in the modern, modern day. Um, as I said, this is this important theme of linking economic history to modern economic performance in Nick's work. Um, and that sort of, links to the incredible record of policy activism that Nick has had um, in UK policy circles, particularly with respect to influence uh, in the UK Treasury. Uh, Nick's work was the subject of a kind of major research assessment exercise impact study for the Department of e e Economics at Warwick's uh, recently. I, can, I think it's fair to say that Nick you know, in, in his work, this activist work from the mid to late 90s onwards into the 2000s really helped set the direction of post Thatcher economic policy in Britain, right? And he was part of this, I think, it really important what we can see of some as something of a golden age of uh, evidence based policy making in the late 90s into the 2000s. Um, finally, you know, Nick has had this incredible influence as a PhD supervisor of, of people like Steve Broadbury, who's here today. Um, and, you know, this is even more marked by the fact that, you know, he's part of that one of the last generations of scholars who don't actually have a PhD, right? I, I think that's right, Nick, please. <laughs> we had, um, and, you know, finally, I'd just like to note, you know, and a personal level kind of, you know, Nick's shrewdness, wisdom and, and calm demeanor is a great professional example to us all. Okay, so that's Nick Crafts. Uh, in terms of uh, today's speaker, Hans Joachim Voss, again, I can give the usual sort of list of sort of achievements, listing of the achievements, UBS Foundation Professor um, at Zurich, previous positions at UPF in Cambridge, an uh, interesting interlude before becoming a full-blooded academic at McKinsey, numerous visiting positions at places like Berkeley, Princeton, NYU, and MIT. I think with what Kim's you know, research, I, I sort of summarize it in terms of two, two major strands of work. Firstly, is what you would call like the traditional economic history strand, where similar to Nick, a lot of Joachim's early work uh, you know, was based on, it had an in-depth focus on, on the Industrial Revolution. And, you know, this work was marked by, you know, you know, the receipt of a number of major prizes in economic history research, such as the Lazato Geshankran, Gesh, Geshankran uh, and Larry Neal prizes for economic history research. Um, I think, you know, to me, you know, some examples of Joachim's early works are really mark, um, you know, the different, different strands uh, and, and different uh, approaches he takes. So, you know, there's a flair for asking big questions. So an early good example of this would be a paper in the Journal of Economic History, did high wages or high interest rates bring down the, the Weimar Republic? 
there's a strand of important what I call documentary work, right? So a really interesting innovative paper, The Longest Year's New Estimates of Labour Input in England, 1760 uh, to 1830. And then what I would call like a clear kind of creative and eclectic strand of work. Um, for example, the paper in the Journal of Inter... You know, you're going to probably hate me for digging out these papers, Joaquin. The Journal of Interdisciplinary History, Physical Exertion and Stature in the Habsburg Monarchy. Um, so that's an example of you know, the different strands of work that, that flair for asking big questions and taking a creative and ec eclectic approach. Of course, you know, um, you know, Joachim has made major contributions over the last 10 to 15 years. And what you would think of as sort of you know, bringing in causal inference in a major way in economic history, in particular, focusing on topics related to the economic history of Nazi Germany and the historical roots of anti-Semitism in Europe. Um, finally, I'll say in terms of this introduction, um, you know, at, similar to Nick, you know, Joachim is a you know, gracious uh, senior researcher, very encouraging of new talent. I've heard, heard many accounts of kind of young researchers uh, talk about the advice and input what, that Joachim has given to them in terms of their research. And he also is, is someone who's clearly energized by this interaction with young researchers. So that's it. I hope I haven't embarrassed any of our speakers with that discussion, uh, but it was a real pleasure to sort of, you know, go through their work and put together these notes. Um, so I'll hand it over to Wakeem. So uh, people watching online, there's going to be a Slido link where you can ask questions. We're gonna have a mix of questions taken from the Slido and asked from within the room. Uh, after uh, after Joaquin's lecture. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mirko. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me and thank you all for, for being here today. And allow me to just say uh, how much it pleases me to be able to give the annual crafts lecture for as long as I've thought of myself as an economic historian, I've admired Nick as a person and his research. And I feel very honored that I'm allowed to deliver a lecture uh, that bears his name today. And with that, let me get going. So I'm going to talk about origins of extremism, insights from the rise of the Nazi party. And it used to be that if you were interested in things like the fall of Weimar democracy, you'd have to apologize a little bit to your audience and say, yes, I know it's mostly of historical interest, or maybe there's some marginal country somewhere on the fringes of the developed world at best that might experience some political instability. Um, but it's important to think about these nonetheless. And that's probably the only good thing that's come out of this. Uh, but in the last 10 years, this has become much easier to argue uh, in terms of contemporary relevance. So you can probably do worse than to start a lecture on this theme with the picture of this shaman, um, part of the crowd that stormed the Capitol, um, claiming that uh, President Trump was the legitimate winner of the 2020 presidential election. And democracies don't just rise, they become more, much more common over the long term, but they've also sometimes gone away. The trend towards democratization has not been the end point of history, as Fukuyama argued, um, but in some cases, we've actually seen important reversals. So if you look at the very long term, say on the long sweep of history from 1800 to the present, then the number of places or the percentage of the population living in countries that can be classified as democracies, of course, has been on a sharply upward trend but you have these periods here most marked in the 1930s and early 1940s where things go into reverse. And the same thing happens in the 50s and 60s before surging upwards again. And of course, there's nothing that guarantees that the overall trend will always be pointing upwards. There's many people who think, for example, that we're in a competition between authoritarian regimes like China in terms of delivering the goods that people want, and that it's not obvious that the uh, by now quite old model of Western democracies will always be able to deliver the goods. If you actually look at what people say, um, of the 1930s cohort, for example, in America, um, 
70% said it's essential to live in a democracy. If you ask people born in the 1980s, this number is down to 30%. So there's been a hollowing out of support for democracy as the only good way to live in what is until now the biggest and most successful um, multi-ethnic democracy uh, in the history of mankind. And the other thing that, of course, causes major worries is spread of populist parties in the last 10 years. There's an ex certain extremist movements of extremist agitation. Depends on how you count it, but uh, some people argue that mass protests, for example, of extreme parties are by a factor of seven in the last 10 years, in the last 20 years alone. And all over Western Europe, including in countries that we thought were guaranteed to be immune from the populist virus, like Spain and Germany, we've seen the resurgence of far right parties with a populist flavor. So that's the contemporary interpretation, but I think there's a sort of broader theme in the background um, that's been motivating much of my research interests in this area, and it's considerably more big picture um, that we can also tackle by thinking through about where does the fragility of democracies come from and what does the German case have to teach us? Because of course, in some ways, um, the Germans don't just commit the crime of the century, but possibly the crime of the millennium. Um, there's this end point um, in the background always lurking in all our thinking about what happens in Germany in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, that is the camps, it's the industrial extermination of millions of people, systematic, deliberate, um, extremely thorough, um, and only stopped by the victory of allied arms. So what I also want to do is in surveying the various angles here that help us think through about where extremism comes from, where uh, the rise of um, extremist movements comes from, is to also tackle a broader and more anthropological question, which of course I cannot answer with uh, any degree of uh, definite insight, which is why do people end up doing terrible things? And let me just sort of be completely transparent here. Uh, this for me is not just an intellectual question. It's not just a question for you know, the normal educated Western European. It's also a personal question. So one of the key motivating uh, factors in the background for me has been that one of my grandparents, uh, a man who I loved very much was actually, as I learned after his death, a member of the Nazi party. He was actually a stormtrooper. He left his denazification papers to me because he never felt he could talk about these things, but he wanted me to have the evidence since he knew I'd become a historian um, and to, to, to look through the documents and pass judgment on my own. Um, so the bigger question, of course, beyond personal interest is to ask ourselves, how do terrible things happen? And I think if you want to be very generic, you can think of four broad approaches. One is the standard Marxist approach. Bad stuff happens because somebody profits from it. And in this perspective, fascism is just like all other bad stuff. It's ultimately a logical outgrowth of the ownership of production, means of production. Uh, there's a materialist logic to everything that goes wrong on earth. And the second you uh, change the ownership structure, good things will happen instead. There's a radically different approach uh, that I will touch on briefly because it's going to be, to my own surprise, related to some of the things I'll show you in a minute. Um, there's a book by Danny Goldhagen called Hitler's Willing Executioners that basically argues that the Germans commit the Holocaust because they've been waiting to do it for 500 years. That already in Martin Luther's writings, there's a genocidal form of anti-Semitism waiting to burst onto this stage, and that it is industrialization that makes it possible to actually implement this genocidal program. Meaning that there's something about German culture that makes the entire country just waiting to commit the crime of the millennium. There's a third alternative approach that I call theory of the masses that basically thinks of all forms of totalitarianism and fascism is just one as driven by essentially a cutting of the roots of people that 
used to live in the countryside and stable communities, working the land, and they're now all suddenly finding themselves in large cities uh, in industrial employment. And these rootless masses then are basically becoming victims. They fall for the uh, pipers of totalitarian ideology. And this is very much prominent in the work of Hannah Arendt or of the Spanish philosopher Ortega y Gasset. A fourth approach uh, thinks about this from a social psychology point of view. So if you look at the Milgram experiment, for example, or the Zimbardo experiment, they essentially argue that all of us somewhere in the back of our psyches carry the seeds of cooperating in acts of evil, that conformity, the willingness to follow orders, to believe in authority is so deeply ingrained in us and in the way our societies work, that these things could happen everywhere, anytime. And the Milgram experiment is directly uh, inspired by uh, Milgram having watched uh, the uh, Eichmann uh, trial in Jerusalem. Um, and for Zimbardo too, who puts students in the situation of either being prison, uh, prisoners in a fictitious prison or uh, guards, um, he feels that the social situation immediately basically takes away almost all degrees of individual freedom and makes people do things. So they're all just following orders, which of course, if you sort of write it on a grand scale, begs the question, why don't things like this happen all the time? So what I want to do with today is to use some of these perspectives, but maybe supplement and complement them a little bit with some economics, with some social science, and then look for some uh, unifying themes in what the empirical data tells us about where these movements come from, where these beliefs come from, where why people join extremist movements um, and what happens when they do. So if we think about this in the context of economics, of course, the economics that we used to teach people uh, at introductory micro classes, a complete uh, caricature, uh, of course, as people are maximizing utility, they're omniscient, they're, um, selfish. And then over the last 20, 30 years, there was more evidence here and there, at first completely unsystematic, that people were not quite behaving like that. For example, people tend to be much more generous than we normally expect them to be in many experimental settings. People reciprocate where it's actually bad for them, but it helps to sustain cooperative equilibria. People engage in altruistic punishments, in other words, and so on. And the interesting thing I think is that in recent years, what we've increasingly seen is that this sort of better nature of ourselves, which seemed to be revealed by what I flippantly called here economics 2.0, is only skin deep. So many of these forms of surprisingly unselfish of moral behavior can go away very, very quickly. So for example, if you give people a chance not to be at home, when they know that somebody is gonna come by and ask for a charity contribution, they will do that. People don't cheat, even if it's pretty clear that they're not gonna be caught, but if they see that somebody else is cheating, they all start to cheat on a huge scale. So, um, it's clear that these seemingly good forms of behavior are often only skin deep and they can go away in terms of context very, very quickly. And I think one of the things that's sort of unifying and underlying some of the research I'm about to show you is this idea that in order to behave well, it's not enough to have the incentive and to behave badly, it's not enough to have the incentive, but it depends on context. It depends on what other people around you do, because as humans, we all care about what other people think, what they think of us, and take a large, very large leaf from what they define as acceptable or unacceptable behavior. Now, of course, that's not a completely novel insight. Adam Smith already said that humans crave recognition, that bettering our condition is to be observed, to be attended to, to be taken notice of with sympathy and approbation and flipped uh, on its head, of course, in the immortal words of Jean-Paul Sartre, hell is other people. So um, you can see how this can easily 
cut two ways. So what I'm going to do today is review some of the research I've done in this space. Um, and I'm first going to look at <clears throat> what I think of as nuclei of extremist beliefs that help to propel the Nazi party to power, which is the long run history of antisemitism in Germany. And this is a case of uh, long term transmission of parents, of grandparents, to children, grandchildren, not necessarily in the same family, but uh, typically from one generation to the next. Then we're going to zoom in on the 1920s, and I will show you some results from work on how people join the Nazi party, what it takes to do that, and how social capital is actually an important contributor to this. And this is going to help us understand where this core of committed members of the Nazi party comes from. But this is before it's actually big. It only becomes big in electoral terms in the early 1930s. And the key moment when this happens coincides with a financial crisis. And we're gonna use this financial crisis to sort of look more closely at the power of narratives, of hate narratives, that then combined with an observable event becomes seemingly plausible. Then we're going to go even more micro. We're just gonna look at one German city, that's some recent work I've done. Um, where we look at what I call contagious extremism. And we'll try to see how within one city, support for the Nazi party spreads. And then by the time the Nazis come to power, <clears throat> they do get massive electoral support. They have a very large number of members, but they never get a majority. And it's not the case that all Germans join the Nazi party. So we also need to think about what entrenches them because there's no question that by the end of the 1930s, this is probably the most popular regime in German history. And if you talk to your grandparents today, if I could talk to my grandparents today, and sadly they're all dead. Um, the one thing they would always say, and friends of mine confirm that their grandparents said this too, it wasn't all bad, you know, at least they built the highways. And that's gonna be the punchline of the last thing that I look at before wrapping up the offering some suggestions for where to take this in the future. Okay, so with that, let me mention that, of course, I didn't do all of these things on my own. Uh, I sort of got into this actually almost against my will because Tom Ferguson, uh, my political science friend at the University of Amherst, suggested strongly that we look at the effect of political connections on stock market values, which we did. Um, over a decade ago. Um, and then I wrote a whole bunch of papers together with my first PhD student, Nico Voigtländer, um, where we explored many of these issues, and then some more recent work with other co-authors. Okay, so <clears throat> let me first tell you about a plague, a plague that's uh, been rescued from obscurity due to the unfortunate events of the last year and a half. Uh, the last time we have a really major plague spreading across all of Europe in 1347 to uh, 1350, it doesn't just kill a lot of people, it kills 30 to 50% of the population. It also creates a persecution, systematic persecution of uh, a minority, in this case, Jews, and a few handful of cases, also Catalans. Um, and the question is, why is that? So there's initially no backlash against Jews as the plague spreads throughout Europe. Um, and then in Switzerland, in a castle near Lake Geneva, they torture an unfortunate Jew by the name of Agimet, who confesses to a Jewish plot to poison all of Christendom. And this is what the plague is. And this discovery, fake news in the extreme, is communicated to city authorities who then typically write on to other city authorities elsewhere, communicating this insight. And in some places, they actually act on this information. And in the best case scenario, the Jews are expelled or the city hall just ignores it um, and says it's all rubbish. Uh, the Pope comes out and says this is rubbish. The medical faculty of Paris comes out and says this is rubbish. But in quite a few places, people actually do believe the story, and they don't just expel the Jews, but they burn them. 
the Burnham um, entire community depicted in medieval chronicles, um, meaning the entire population is killed. Okay, so what Nico and I did in a paper published about a decade ago was to say, can we check, can we try to see whether the towns and cities in Germany that do this in 1350 are still more anti-Semitic 600 years later when the Nazis come to power. So we first looked at each other when we had the idea and said, it's just too crazy, it can't be true. Um, even if it is true, what would it mean? Um, and it's the kind of idea where you say, well, I don't really want to work on this. It's kind of weird. And then it doesn't go away. And you play a little bit and you find something. That you play some more and a few years later, you've convinced yourself that maybe this is true. Um, and uh, you managed to convince a few others. So what did we do? Um, we coded up all places of Jewish settlement from a wonderful source called Germania Judaica uh, that documents all Jewish life in Germany in the Middle Ages. And then within these, we try to check in which places there's Jewish settlements and you get attacks on Jews. So that's what we did here. And the darker the color here, the more complete the attack on Jewish life in 1350 uh, in medieval Germany. Um, so what are we actually analyzing? If you allow me to zoom in here for a second, think about the two towns of Tübingen and Voigtlingen. Okay, so they're just a few kilometers apart. They both have Jewish communities, but only in Reutling is there an attack on the Jewish population. In Tübingen, there's none. So what we're effectively going to do in one of part of the empirical exercises is to go to neighboring cities, effectively differencing out all sorts of other differences in the background, and just compare places and say, conditional on you having attacked your Jewish community in the Middle Ages, how anti-Semitic do you look in the interwar period? Okay. So the first thing you can do is just to look at pogroms. There are pogroms in the Middle Ages. There's pogroms in the 1920s before the Nazis are in power. There's not a huge number of them, but there's some. So conditional on you having a pogrom in 1349, in 8% of cases, you have a pogrom in the 1920s. If you didn't have a pogrom, that only happens in 1% of cases. Now, you know, 8% is not a huge number, but it's eight times as many. Okay? This is coded in the most careful way possible. So one indicator, low numbers, what can I tell you? We can also look at uh, votes for the Nazi party in 1928, when they're sort of in their state of ideological purity, when they really say what they mean, and they say, you know, we're for violent overthrow, and we want to get rid of the Jews and so forth, before they eat a lot of chalk that makes them acceptable to the rest of the population. And what we find is that in places with medieval pogroms, the vote share for the Nazi party is roughly double what it is elsewhere. Okay, and you can match and do a million things to control for other stuff and it doesn't go away. Then we look at deportations. So uh, there's about 1% of the population, but less in 1933 is Jewish. About half of them emigrate, the rest stays and is overwhelmingly deported uh, and killed. So it's a Tricky data, but for what it's worth, we have the individual level records of where people are from that are being deported. And we can just compare this to the number of reported Jews in 1933. And as you can see that in, in those places where you had medieval pogroms, the entire distribution shifted to the right, meaning that in the modal case here, the share of Jews that is actually deported to the camps is about twice as high as it is um, in the, the rest of towns and cities. If you look at synagogue attacks, you find the same thing. So there's a staged, centrally coordinated, but not centrally directed attack on Jewish life in 1938, known as Reichskristallnacht, a night of broken glass, euphemistically. And what we see is that the probability of you having an attack, not having an attack, is four times as high in places that didn't have medieval pogroms. We supplement this with 
looking at letters written to a particularly anti-Semitic uh, newspaper. And we find the same pattern places with medieval patterns of anti-Semitism seem to be doing the same thing. Okay, so a na very natural question that uh, people have asked us uh, after we published this is to say, you know, uh, does it stop here? Have these patterns been washed away? And of course, until at least very recently, anti-Semitism in Germany was almost non-existent. But we can actually use survey data and play the same game in inverted commas. And the German General Social uh, Survey actually asks a whole battery of questions, um, asking people, for example, you know, how would you feel about having a Jewish neighbor? Okay, and there's a range of uh, responses here. You can be particularly philosemitic, saying, you know, one, I don't mind at all. Um, and then seven, no, no, this is an absolutely terrible thing. So we didn't um, take a particularly strong view on which of these indicators we think is most interesting. We just aggregated all of these up. And the first thing is to notice that there's a lot of variation in what people believe. So if you call here, um, the, the most extreme answers, uh, six and seven, for example, uh, five, six, seven, um, then in some places in the upper Palatinate, 48% uh, of the population today still put Jews in the terrible, terrible category. And in other places, it's 10% or less of the population. Okay, so we have very large differences in the cross section. Um, and then we actually looked at the decade of birth when people um, reveal these preferences uh, were born. And strikingly, they're overwhelmingly born in the 1930s. So this is an optimistic graph in the sense that the more recent, uh, the younger the people are, the less anti-Semitic they, they were. Um, as you go back in time, it gets worse and worse. There's a huge peak in 1930. In the 1920s and 1910s, um, it's again less. Now, of course, what do people in the 1930s have in common? Well, they have Nazi schooling in common. They all go to school, they all are forced to join the Hitler Youth, they all live through the war. Um, and for a not entirely trivial share of the population, this, you know, 70 years later, still seems to influence how they think about a minority that, uh, of course, they haven't met or interacted with in any frequency in the meantime. Um, now, in terms of geographical patterns, if you go and look at um, two indicators of anti-Semitism, um, the share of anti-Semites, uh, uh, votes for anti-Semitic parties in the late imperial period between 1890 and 1912, you see that in those places where a lot of uh, people voted in favor of these parties, there's Broad measure of anti-Semitism, just average responses, is much higher than in places where you had very few or no votes for these anti-Semitic parties. If you look at the share of extremists, it's also much higher uh, in those towns and cities. If you compare it to voting for the Nazi party again in 1928, when it said it's purist, you get pretty much the same pattern, uh, both broad and committed anti-Semitism, much, much higher um, uh, 70 years later. So there's a lot of transmission apparently from one generation to the next. Uh, it's just documenting this fact and you know by now many people shrug their shoulders when they hear persistence but uh, this was shifting priors uh, a decade or two ago. Uh, I still remember vividly when I you know, gave this type of talk in America and people would look at you and say this is crazy how on earth can this happen? Whereas Europeans would typically say, yeah, well, you know, it's what else is new, you know, in my French village, you know, the neighbors were for the, for the king and they still are kind of conservative and we were for the revolution and we were all socialist. So uh, I think the transmission of attitudes itself has become a standard staple of cultural economics. The fact that it can happen over such a long period and the mechanisms that potentially underlie this, I think are very much an open question. And, um, there's a number of dimensions one can think about why this happens, uh, but the persistence of these things in daily folklore and uh, uh, plays, for example, passion plays in Bavaria, but also in images. Uh, you know, many German towns and cities have images of the Jewish pig showing Jews in demeaning poses, you know, sucking the teats of a pig and so forth. Um, 
There's a lot of that imagery going on in Frankfurt. It's one of these decorates a bridge leading into the city. The US Army blows it up when it enters in 1945. Um, but you find this all over Northern Europe and you find it in many parts of Germany. And I think it's a very interesting question to ask whether this is one of the things that contributes to the perpetuation of these kinds of beliefs. Okay, so that's one form of how others influence uh, people. It's not just uh, one generation to the next, it's also contemporaries, neighbors, peers. Um, so the next thing we did was to see whether we can use the insights from this buoyant literature, peer effects, neighbors, or you know, in this case, um, a Hollywood movie called The Joneses, where you know this happy family isn't a family at all. They're actually just stealth marketers who are sort of selling the image of the perfect family. They're consuming the right stuff, but they live in a house that's slightly bigger. They have this car that's slightly nicer. You know, they're just a little bit more handsome and cool, and all the neighbors start to aspire to who they are. Um, I think it offers some insight into uh, human nature. And what we try to do and want to do here is to see whether this can actually inform our understanding of what happens in the interwar period uh, in the end. So there's a beautiful piece of social science research by the sociologist Theodor Abel, who was smart enough to emigrate to the United States uh, in the early 1930s. But for obvious reasons, as you can guess from his name, he's Jewish. Um, he was interested in the rise of the Nazi party. And he put a newspaper in, a, he put an ad in a Nazi newspaper saying, essay competition. You can win 500 Reichsmarks, a small fortune, by writing the best essay on the question, how I became a Nazi. And they got over 800 of these autobiographical essays on how people became Nazis. And they all kept in Stanford, they've all survived. Um, and they've been digitized. So you can actually look at them. And here's what one of the people who joined the Nazi party and sent in a return had to say. And he said, I became acquainted with a colleague of my own age with whom I had frequent conversations. He was a calm, quiet person whom I esteemed very highly. When I found out that he was one of the local leaders of the National Socialist Party, my opinion of it as a group of criminals changed completely. So this guy starts with the right idea. He thinks the Nazis are a bunch of crooks and criminals. And then he meets one of them and he thinks he's very nice. He's this sort of impressive person. He completely changes his mind. So this happens time and again. This is like stealth marketing. It's like the Joneses. So we know, for example, from the work of an uh, American historian uh, by the name of Kosha, um, that all over Germany, you have these people who are very deeply integrated into local society through clubs, through associations. In this case, Emil Wissner was a middle-aged salesman. He's an avid athlete. He's a shopkeeper. He has the Marburg chapter of the um, Shopkeeper Association. So in many ways, this is the sort of guy that Robert Putnam tells you will make democracy work and civic society perfect because he's just so bringing so much social capital to the table. Except that in 1929, he joins the Nazi party and then becomes uh, a counselor for the, for the party um, and so forth. So what we did was to say, can we generalize this? Is it the case that in towns and cities where you have more social capital, where networks of clubs and associations are denser, the Nazi party spreads more quickly. It's like a virus, which we know that if you don't keep social distance, we'll find it much easier to infect people, say in a crowded cinema. So here's a very simple way of just showing you how much of a difference it makes. Here we just stratify all German towns and cities, depending on the number of clubs and associations that you have, which we had to code up from uh, address books at the time. And you can see that places with above median association density show a much more rapid rise in the number of Nazi party members. Now, the two curves do track each other. 
uh, there's an aggregate shock, but it does happen at a much higher rate. So that suggests that this is one of the mechanisms through which this works, and it helps us to resolve this puzzle that some people have raised, saying, you know, <laughs> Germany is a place of where everybody belongs to an association of two or three, you know, budgie breeders, uh, <clears throat> uh, the uh, local beer drinkers association, and uh, the soccer club, and so forth. Why didn't this rescue Weimar democracy? Because it's neutral. Social capital itself is just a tool. It's a way to overcome collective action problems. It reduces the social distance between people. And it can, be, it can do this for good and for bad. It can convince you um, to do the right thing. And it can bring you to do the wrong thing because you've been in contact with people spreading the wrong type of idea. OK, so here's just showing the same thing in the cross section. Uh, the more, the higher the association density the higher the, the entry rate into the, the Nazi party. Um, okay. So how does this change our view of the rise of the Nazi party? So if you go back to these generic different approaches that I surveyed in the beginning uh, in a very uh, summary way, this theory by Arendt and Ortega y Gasset that social isolation, that these rootless masses are what totalitarianism feeds on, this is exactly wrong. What this suggests is the exact opposite. It's the well-integrated people with lots of connections who are also much more likely to catch the Nazi bug, if you will. Um, and that this turns into a fatal weakness for Weimar society in a particular context. And we develop this a little bit further and we sort of look at um, how well the state works in different federal regions of Germany and show that it's especially where the state is no longer strong, but actually has lots of changing coalitions, for example, as an indicator of state capacity that this actually starts to backfire. So in areas like Prussia, for example, where the government is stable and actually gets a lot of stuff done, social capital is not corrosive, but in other parts where you have some reasons to start to doubt whether democracy can deliver, can deliver stability, law and order uh, growth, uh, is a lack of effectiveness of the state, social capital seems associated with very rapid entry into the Nazi party. Okay, now let me move forward in terms of this story. So now we're in the 1930s, early 1930s. The Nazis have had their first electoral breakthrough in 1930, getting to 16% of the vote, largely on the back of having the biggest ground uh, grassroots organization of any political party in Germany. So they go from 2.8 in 1928 to 16%. And what happens in between is this first big surge in membership, some of which we think we can attribute to this density of social networks. Now, they go from 16 to the high 30s within the next two years, less than two years. And the thing that happens in between is a gigantic financial crisis. And okay, fast forward here, this is joint work with. Um, Jose Luis Pedro, Sebastian de, de Stefan Gisler. So this is German industrial production. Um, in the late, late 1920s, uh, early 30s, and you can see that um, in the early, in early 1931, output is already trending down, but it's only fallen by about three and a half, four percent And then this thing with a gray bar here happens, and that is the German banking crisis. So just like in the US, Germany has a phenomenally large financial crisis in 1931. And many people, not just us, have argued that this turns the a normal bad garden variety recession into the mother of all depressions. Okay, So by the end of it, output is down by 10% and it only stops falling once our industrial output is down by 17% or so. Okay, So people, of course, have looked at this. And at the same time as output plummets and unemployment goes to 6 million, the Nazi party goes from 16 to 38% uh, share of the vote. And nothing is more natural than to think that this, these two things must be related. And sadly, in the cross-section, 
people have never been able to show this. So this is like the holy grail of thinking about where the support for the Nazi party come from. In the cross-section, connecting distress, economic distress with the success of the Nazi party has basically eluded everybody who's tried their hand on this. The reason is the following. We don't have great data on why, uh, how bad things are locally. We have unemployment figures, but they're very bad because they basically measure um, whether you're covered by social insurance and then you get kicked out and so forth. And high, finally great output data we almost don't have. So what we find is that the unemployed vote for the communists and the Nazi party, there doesn't seem to be a strong, clear economic connection. So what uh, we did here was to say, well, this financial crisis itself, of course, is a major shock if one of the banks fails. You may lose deposits, you may lose uh, loans, uh, access to loans that you were getting. Um, you may lose access to transfer services. So this may be the financial crisis itself might be a driver of economic distress. And what we want to argue is that the financial crisis itself actually becomes one of those key things that drives increasing support for the Nazi party, which interestingly is something that the Nazis in the summer of 1932, before they actually score big, but when they're already on the up, say themselves, okay? So here's one piece of evidence. I was talking about this big upward shift in electoral support, September 1932, July 1932. And look at these two curves. There's the black one. This is towns and cities that do not have a branch of the bank that is at the center of this financial crisis. And then there's the blue line where you actually have exposure to this bank. And we measure it by the presence of branches as well as firms having a lending relationship most likely with this particular bank, okay? So it's not the only bank that fails, but it's particularly prominent. And I'll show you in a second why we think that this particular bank's failure is decisive. So you can do this in a variety of ways. You can do it in a diff and diff setting and you see nothing in terms of electoral results before. This is all relative to 1930. So before the, the, the financial crisis, there's no extra gain in votes for the Nazi party. There's a big upward jump afterwards and that's where it stays. It never goes down. It doesn't start to fade at all. So what do we use? We have this data on whether you borrow a firms in your city borrowed from Danat or whether you have a branch. And as you can see, it's all over, east to west, north to south. Um, uh, we got you covered. Um, and then the question, of course, is why would the failure of this one bank actually make such a difference to electoral support for the Nazi party? And this is, I think, where it gets interesting. Now, here's just a cartoon from a leading Nazi newspaper called Der Sturmer. Um, and uh, you can see a disgusting, obese Jewish banker hanging the German small businessman, okay? So this is what they start to publish. This is what they start to spread as propaganda, as a story, as a hate narrative, how because this bank is led by a leading Jewish financier, Jakob Goldschmidt, the Jews are responsible for Germany's misery. How this bankruptcy reveals how rotten the system, both politically and economically, um, but engineered and coordinated by Jews actually is. And the turn towards anti-Semitism that happens after the banking crisis is so widespread, it's so common that it even makes it into the music hall. Um, so there's, the, um, there's a cabaret show <clears throat> Uh, that uh, starts to tour in the fall of 1931. Um, and the refrain is that everything is the Jews' fault. Okay, so whether an aphrodisiac is becoming more expensive or Marlene Dietrich uh, is um, you know, uh, uh, starring in a movie, whether the jokes on the radio are kind of poor, it's all the Jews' fault. And if you don't believe it, well, of course, it is the Jews' fault too, okay? So people are already making fun of this because it's, ta ta uh, it's um, 
uh, getting out of hand. Um, now, let me just show you what exercise we do here. There's one bank, Dana, that's led by Jakob Goldschmidt, prominently um, my uh, uh, Jewish CEO. There's a second bank that also fails, Dres fails. It's called Dresdner Bank. It has Jews on its board, but it's nowhere near as strongly identified with the crisis. It's not blamed in Nazi newspapers. It's not the target of cartoons or anti-Semitic propaganda. And what we can do is to look at income. Uh, income data is kind of bad, but um, it's much better, I think, or much more helpful in this context than unemployment data. And if we actually look at changes in income, then the effect of having Darnat fail or Dresdner fail is about the same. It's associated with about a 30% fall in income during the crisis. But only when, the, in the case of Darnat, is there an effect on Nazi party voting. So a small positive, insignificant coefficient for Dresdner, and if you put both of them in the same regression, you find nothing, okay? So now for the proof that this is actually to do with the power of narratives, maybe um, we searched newspapers for mentions of Darnard versus the other big banks. And you can see before the banking crisis, they're all very low and they're trending um, in parallel. If anything, Dresdner is more prominently mentioned. Then the crisis hits and it's Darnard that's all over the newspaper front pages. And then you look at who do they mention, and here is just counting the number of times that any one of the leading bankers on the boards of these different companies is mentioned, Goldschmidt, Nata, and Kurtz Wassermann. And you can see the ratio is basically, during the crisis period, something like you know, 25 to 1. Okay? So the other thing we can do is to say, well, Maybe the effect of this was not uniform. So the shock is the same. If you are exposed to Danat, it's always bad. But maybe it depends on what kind of mental matrix, what framework, what interpretive tools you already have to think about the situation and its implications. So here we stratify our samples and we look at places that already had historical pogroms or that already had votes for anti Semitic parties. And what we see is that there's a synergy between these two. So in places where you had high support for anti-Semitic parties before 1910, the financial crisis, exposure to Danad, drives up votes for the Nazi party in particular. And the same is true for having a historical record of pogroms. So what does this tell us? The electoral rise of the Nazi party coincides with the Great Depression. And until now, we've never really had a good way to connect economic misery with radicalization. Now, it's the banking crisis that really turns the recession into a depression. And what we have is evidence hand collected based on which firm borrows from whom that shows or suggests that one of the things that boosts the Nazi party votes is actually financial exposure. And the thing that we argue, the thing that the Nazi party itself says is that it helps them sell their hate story, the hate narrative to the middle classes. And in retrospect, the Völkischer Beobachter, the leading mouthpiece of the Nazi movement in May 1932 says that it was the events of the summer of 1931 that proved to the bourgeois middle how right we've always been, okay? So this is um, the, the story we want to tell here. So we're not going to say that economic factors don't play a role. I think it's just that we haven't thought about it and we try to measure it quite in the right way. Now, I do want to share with you some more recent research that builds on the theme of these different um, papers that I've already mentioned. So, what many parties, many places march for their cause. It's one of the key ways in which people try to show strength and garner support. Uh, the Nazis are no different, but what they do do is to do this on a very grand scale. And we can actually look inside their heads and see what the 
party says about this kind of propaganda tool. And they say, better than 10 meetings, 1,000 posters and 10,000 pamphlets are mass rallies. And they recount how in Hanover, they had a mass rally. It got out a lot of people. And then they said, we can see the effect in the marked increase in votes at the polling stations near the site of the rally. And when I saw this, I thought, huh, I've never seen that data. So disaggregated. I wonder if this is true. Okay. So what we did, I wanted to do it for Berlin, couldn't find the data. So we did it for Hamburg. Um, the beautiful thing about doing this for 1932 in Hamburg is that there's only one period when you can actually have marches, when they're actually allowed, which is there's a window to do with blackout periods around elections. And it's just before the city diet election in April. Okay, so we have basically flash bulbs going off four times, five times, depending on how you want to count it. Every time you see how far the support for the Nazi party has come. And then there's one period where you have two marches in uh, rapid succession. And we can just compare before and after. So it's essentially just a diff and diff, but with a lot of super detailed data. So this is what the Nazi vote shares in Hamburg look like. Uh, there's two rounds of presidential elections. Uh, Hitler is narrowly defeated by the incumbent president uh, von Hindenburg. And you can see how the whole distribution keeps moving to the right. So what's the idea here? Well, this is a bit Mickey Mouse, but let me just walk you through the logic of what we're thinking. So we're all connected to each other in all sorts of ways. There's some people you've met, you know them. If you meet them in the street, you're going to stop and ask how they are. There's some people who come from the same home region. There are people that you share a profession with. So there's an unmeasured, n-dimensional thing that connects many people to others. But of course, there's groups that have almost no connections, like your Twitter account saying, you know, nobody that you follow follows X. So this is what we're meant to depict here. Every dot is a person. Every line is a connection of some kind. Then we're going to have exposure, in our case, this Nazi march. So some people will actually see something or learn something or be impressed by something. And that's like an insertion point. And the idea that we want to pursue conceptually is to see whether some of the effect of this propaganda spreads along the lines of these social connections in the form of these contagion paths. So what we're going to do is to actually see whether First, we see an impact in a group of people that are treated, and then how this effect spreads through something that we try to measure as a social network. Here's part of the data that we can use. It's data on polling stations. Uh, so there's 622 of them all over Hamburg, ultra finely grained data. Um, the other thing that we have is data from Hamburg's address book. So for every single household in Hamburg, we digitize their address, we digitize their name, we know their profession, um, and we have some indicators of their socioeconomic status and things like regional origin derived from their last names, etc. Okay. So then what we did was to digitize the marching routes, which always start at some assembly points, then they rally somewhere in the city, and then they go somewhere a little bit further out to have a really big mass event. Then we need data on how people are connected. And this is what uh, we did. We looked at the Spanish flu. And what you can see here is the number of deaths by week in Hamburg in 1917, 1918, 1919. And as you can see, 1918 is really bad, especially in the weeks 37 to 45 or so. So we take these excess deaths and then try to correlate them between different districts to get a sense of which deaths move in lockstep. And the idea is that if you're exposed to a disease that's highly communicable, just like COVID, then being in the same spot increases the chances that you're gonna catch it. And it doesn't have to be the case that you talk to each other, you might be standing right next to each other in the tram, but if you talk to each other, chances are that you're gonna get it with a much higher probability, uh, just like with COVID. <laughs> 
So that's one measure that we're going to use for indirect exposure. We're also going to use this multidimensional vector of household characteristics. Do you have the same profession? Do you have the same regional origin? Do you come from a similar social class? So we have uh, these two things that we're going to throw at the data to see whether there's this sort of secondary effect in the way um, uh, Nazi support spreads throughout the population. So here's a very simple way to visualize the result. The black lines are again where the marches are. The darker a red circle is, the bigger the swing for the Nazi party. Now, if you just sort of uh, eyeball the data, suggest it's probably going to work. No. Um, so if you're really far away, there's almost no areas in which you get a big swing. Here's what the data looks like. So if you bin the distances to the march and you look at the change in the Nazi vote share, you can see how this lines up very nicely. This is what we call the direct effect, meaning that if you can see the march, you're close to it, you're exposed to it in some form, shape or size, then there's a discontinuous large step up in your level of Nazi support. You can check whether there's any pre-trends or whether they select things towards areas that are already swinging towards the Nazis. None of that's true. Okay. So then we have the second measure of connectedness, uh, which is exposure, for example, through occupations. And here, just to sort of fix ideas, we look at train conductors. Train conductors only have 18% of households headed by train conductors exposed to the Nazi march itself, which we define as being within 200 meters of the marching route itself, okay? Contrast this with clockmakers. 38% of them get to see the march directly. There's no big difference in social standing. And what we're basically going to do is to say, is it the case that districts that caught the Spanish flu in 1918 at the same time also catch the Nazi bug at the same time in 1932? And is it the case that places where a lot of people from the same occupation saw the march start to swing more towards the Nazi party. Okay, now the underlying idea is, of course, that demonstrations, marches, rallies can create additional support for an extremist um, movement. Um, we're going to argue that it's causal. You can instrument this by things like width of the street. Um, it's also possible that some of this creates backlash, meaning if people are already not convinced and they're faced with this particular form of propaganda, they may actually change their mind, but in the opposite direction of the one intended by the organizers of the march. So here's how the direct effect evolves over time. So you can see that in the elections immediately before the marches, there's no trend towards more direct support in areas that are within 200 meters of the marching route. Then this jumps up and it starts getting bigger, uh, but not by much in terms of direct effect. The indirect effect, which is this thing based on flu connections and um, homophily, there's also no pre-trend. You see it jump up, but it does get bigger over time. And it also stays at an elevated level right until the end of the period in which we have elections, free and fair elections at all. Okay, now this is saying conditional on the share of votes that you, the Nazis already had, what is the effect? And if you just look on the left-hand side, what this is saying is that unless you already have like a 35% share of support for the Nazi party, the march itself makes no difference, at least none that we can detect statistically. But Above it, you start to really add to electoral support. The indirect exposure turns positive at lower levels of Nazi support, but it also has this negative domain, not necessarily significant, but definitely point estimates much, much lower. And then above a certain threshold, it starts to turn massively positive. So if you put these things together and you say, you know, this is the vote share. Um, <clears throat> pre-marches, um, how much is backlash, how much is persuasion, you get this very symmetric uh, set of results. Uh, it's not mechanical. That we estimate where there's this crossover point, uh, the net effect of Nazi marches is actually positive, but you do have this part where it's actually more polarizing 
uh, with actually creating backlash. So in, on net, in the aggregate, it's actually a, has a polarizing effect. So what do we show? We show evidence for two joint mechanisms. Propaganda works. It works through persuasion. That's interesting because voting is a private act. You're not seen when you vote in the voting booth. So it's not about what your neighbor thinks and whether it's socially acceptable. It's what you think is right. But there's contagion in that. And that's interesting because we normally tend to think that things that have a sort of social desirability mechanism built in, what does my neighbor think of me and what does it think better or worse if I do the right thing, that that's probably most susceptible to contagion. But we even find it in the setting where it's not obvious that there should be any at all. Now, in order to leave some time for questions, allow me to very briefly talk about the last thing that I want to touch on, which is the consolidation of Nazi power. Um, so this is from uh, my paper, uh, Highway to Hitler, also with Nico Voigtländer. Um, and what we do and argue is to basically say that there's massive electoral support for the Nazis when they come to power, but they're nowhere near uh, at levels of almost universal support. And one of the things that really does it is to show just how effective the Nazi regime can be, how much they can actually get Germany going, while of course claiming credit for the economic revival that's in some ways already underway when Hitler comes to power, but then is actually marketed as a success of employment policies and so forth. So what do we do? We actually look at unfree elections in which you couldn't express preferences for other parties or anything else, but there's a plebiscite, a plebiscite that turns Hitler into the Führer. He's just the chancellor and then the president dies and then they unify the offices of president and chancellor and what becomes the Führer uh, of the German Reich. And what we see is that in places that are very close to where the new highways are being built, there's massively more support, a big increase in support for the Nazi party. Whereas if you're further away, it becomes smaller and smaller, at some point it actually turns negative, okay? So this happens, this plebiscite happens in 1934. Um, there's no highways actually operational at this point, but they're being built. You can see them in your front yard if you're on the road. Okay, so I'm gonna skip this. Um, this is a very high profile exercise. Uh, Hitler himself turns up for turning the first sort of earth. Um, there's of course no traffic because nothing's been uh, opened by the time the election comes along. So this is all about either the economic effects of the road building or expected benefits in the future or some aggregate change in beliefs about how useful, powerful, effective the Nazi regime is. So this is the Autobahn network in 1934. So everything is either under construction, approved or planned and maybe built at some point in the future. Um, we then correlate this with changes in support at this um, Another side. And again, if you just eyeball the data, it's pretty clear that this is going to come out. I already showed you the summary statistics <clears throat> for different distances too. It's slam bang on where the roads are being built that you see the biggest swings in support of the, the Nazi regime. Um, so there's no pre-trend here on the left-hand side. This is like the last, uh, from the last election to the first Nazi election. Uh, there's no change in support, but then compared to the last, first Nazi election to the plebiscite, you see a massive decline in opposition uh, wherever the highways are being built. Okay, so we have either what's standard in this literature by basically saying where is it sort of technically engineering road building wise best to build this highway least cost path is what they call it. And that's basically just a feature of the terrain. You want to have low gradients, um, not trust. Uh, have to cross too many rivers um, and so on. Okay, so I'm not gonna walk you through the statistical results. Um, what we show is there's a robust association between this prestige project, complex engineering, um, that they get done in record time and that they claim credit for in terms of reducing unemployment. And this helps to entrench the dictatorship by basically showing or convincing people that the regime puts an end to democratic gridlock, people just chattering in parliament. And now these men of action actually get the job done. Um, and we think that the support that this buys is probably 
causal and also reflects selling a particular story. Um, Nazi Germany is not actually the most efficient place, contrary to Hollywood mythology. Uh, you conduct the war in a very inefficient way, for example. But this image of effectiveness and determination and power uh, that the highway building in part projects is probably one of the key contributors to their success. Okay, let me summarize what I've showed you. Um, so we think of a story here where you have these deep roots of anti-Semitism um, that persist over hundreds of years, uh, being passed on from one generation to the next. And after World War I, the point when anti-Semitism was actually at a historic low point before the war breaks out, for a variety of reasons to do partly with economic crisis, but also with a somewhat unfortunate role of Jewish politicians <clears throat> in the end of the war. There's a major spike up in anti-Semitism in interwar Germany. And some of that seems to spread through these dense networks of social capital, revealing a dark side of social capital, if you will. And then building on this network of supporters, the financial shock of the banking crisis in 1931, combined with these old narratives, especially in places where people already have these stories from their grandparents, maybe their parents about anti-Semitism in the back of their minds, seems to create this toxic brew where people start to jump in a particular direction in electoral terms. We can show you how some of the social multiplier works if we go sort of ultra micro, looking at connections between different households, different neighborhoods in Hamburg, sort of see whether in the neighborhoods that are most similar to the ones connected to the marching route, you actually get an extra swing and that's exactly what we find. And then some of that consolidation also seems to have a narrative component where the hate story just is much more easy to sell if it combines with a show of strength and the belief that the new regime is going to put an end to um, a, a decade of squabbling and uh, infighting. Now, let me just offer some very brief thoughts on future research and the big picture. So if you sort of take a step back, um, humans are kind of amazing. Um, one of the things that's amazing about them is that uh, we're the only animal that cooperates in large groups of unrelated individuals. Of course, lions cooperate in prides and bees and ants cooperate, but they're all siblings. Um, almost without exception, um, except for the head male and uh, mammal prides and so forth. So it's hugely important for our success as a species. Um, it creates an important role for identity creating practices that allows this coordination to take place or so commemoration, invented joint histories, rituals, all of these things help in overcoming collective action problems, but they tend to go hand in hand with in-group favoritism and out-group discrimination. So there's a strand in the anthropological literature with some shadows in economic research that suggests that it's conflict, it's violent conflict that actually encourages this type of cooperation. Um, and I think very much an open question is why and how. And what I'm fascinated with and that I would like to think about more in the future is to think how this connection between conflict and the need for cooperation maps into identity creation, say in the form of nationalism, of state capacity, uh, mapping into solving collective action problems that then can flip back into outgroup discrimination and how the things that make us so successful as a species, if you sort of go to the logical conclusion here, overcoming these collective action problems, getting large numbers of completely unconnected people to cooperate, often in surprisingly uh, unselfish ways, how that also creates the potential for all the dark things that we've talked about today and that we see every day, where you have not just in-group favoritism and support and cooperation in groups that are what we think are equals, but also um, uh, out-group discrimination um, and violence. And on that happy note, I shall leave it. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so th thank you very much, Joaquin. That was a fascinating lecture, a really kind of you know, brilliant tour of the, of the research program that you've been conducting with your co-authors. Um, so now we've got some time for questions. Uh, so we can have a mix of questions from on the Slido and from the audience. I'll kick off with a question from off of the Slido. So this is from Andrew Oswald. Okay, so Andrew sort of 
asks, okay, so unhappy people lash out at others, right? Extremely unhappy people lash out in really extreme ways. So why historically do people, uh, do people become extremely unhappy? So I guess, Joaquin, this sort of gets to some of the ideas that you discuss in the context of like the social capital study. Um, so was there evidence of, you know, you talk about the important transmission role that social capital and social associations played, but um, was there evidence of some sort of rump of unhappy uh, individuals who would have formed the initial core of Nazi support? Yeah, so I, I, I think the, the question in a way says, you know, well, what's new here, right? So you have got some people who are miserable and now they start to sort of look for scapegoats and isn't this all kind of trivial? And the interesting and striking thing in this context is that the typical Nazi supporter is not down and out. They're not the unemployed, they're not the sort of um, people who suffer the most from the Great Depression in Germany, but um, this has puzzled people for a long time. It tends to be middle-class people uh, it's a catch-all party, goes across all different groups. So we can't just tell an economic story. Uh, I think that's a very strong conclusion. And the fact that we find a sort of wrinkle that connects it with something economic um, is striking in this literature simply because it's been so hard and so rare to find that kind of connection at all. So misery in all sorts of ways. Yes, people are very unhappy with the democratic regime, maybe for some reasons one can understand, but there's all this other stuff that has nothing to do with misery. So how deep the roots of anti-Semitism in your region are completely uncorrelated with economic conditions in the 1930s. And nonetheless, if you have this interpretive matrix in the back of your mind, that's where you turn, independent of economic conditions. So while we find some shadows of this sort of Marxist view, I think that is probably the thing that I would emphasize the least. Okay, uh, any questions from the physical audience, the face-to-face -face audience? So far, okay, I'll go on with another question from the Slido. Okay, so uh, I think this is coming from Sonia Bellotra, a new professor within, within the department, okay. Um, so can you say if the financial crisis would have encouraged Nazi support, even if Jew Jewish people were not predominant in banking, right? So I guess that's an argument about the specific economic drivers in terms of that financial shock versus how that was identified with a particular ethnic group. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so I think it's probably worth saying that in Germany, just like in many other Western European countries, um, Jews are strongly identified with finance. So this goes back, of course, to Shakespeare and Shylock and this wonderful work by Luigi Pascali and Sasha Becker um, on exactly this. Um, so we cannot fully tell apart anti-finance anti sentiment and anti-Jewish sentiment. We can use some indicators of how prominently Jews are involved in finance. And that doesn't seem to mitigate or aggravate the effects that we have. And one of the sort of in general striking things about anti-Semitism is that the average anti-Semite, including in interwar Germany, has never met, interacted or talked to a Jew directly, right? So in contrast to what Hollywood wants you to believe, 0.8% uh, of the German population in the 1920s are Jewish, and a completely disproportionate share of them lives in a handful of big cities, which means that probably 90% of Germans have never interacted with a Jew at all, but are still many of them are still willing to believe the worst of them, which of course is part of what makes this long-term transmission puzzling too, because Jews for almost all intents and purposes disappear from Germany after 1550. Okay, so um, we've got some questions. People like identification, people like modeling. This seems to be the message from the Slido. Um, okay, so was the Autobahn proximity effect related to jobs created by the needs of their construction? Mm, yeah, okay, so I apologize if I didn't talk enough about identification because you know, it tends to be the techiest part and it takes the longest. So if you want to have a survey, then you know, if you, once you get into the um, rabbit hole of IV it becomes more common. Um, we don't think that the economic effects are actually responsible. Uh, that's for a number of reasons. So it's not as if they start to spend massive amounts of money that are consumed locally or spent locally. They don't hire local construction firms. They mostly cart in people from the large cities that are kept in camps uh, that build the, the highway. 
Um, so there's uh, almost no economic benefit and you don't see it in say changes in the unemployment statistics either. So the idea that this is just a form of sort of pocketbook voting where people just get a benefit from the highway passing by and hence lend their love to the regime of the Fuhrer, that doesn't seem to have a great deal of empirical support. And on that paper, uh, I think the identification is actually kind of reasonable because what we do do is to just say, let's take the highway segments that are built where the engineering algorithm tells us it's best to build it. Um, that is overwhelmingly what the Nazis followed. Right. Claude, did you have a question or are you were giving me advice? On... There is a question on there. Oh, okay. So that's um, Herman. Herman. Does Herman want to? Yeah. Do, would you like to ask that question, Herman? Can... Um, yeah, thanks. Um, um, great, great lecture, Joachim. I really like this. And I also like your very ingenious and creative research strategy. Um, so um, so what, what it tells us is, um, uh, well, an alarming story, maybe, um, um, that, you know, these stories, these, these fake news, you know, can affect the deeper parts of the brain. So in that, in that terms, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's a lot of psychology and maybe less, you know, um, economic sources that, 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 that tell you the story here. On the other hand, your story also might be a little bit too deterministic because what we see in Germany is also what we see, for instance, in Italy, where Mussolini takes power and also does all kinds of, you know, great works. And also here we see that uh, the majority of people, they, they back Mussolini in, in some uh, phases of the 1930s. Um, I would say, you know, sometimes accidents happen and what would what would have happened because Hitler never got a majority? So what would have happened in Germany when the political and industrial leaders would have stand up more against him, like Hindenburg and Hugenberg? Um, so is there a possibility for a counterfactual story, an alternative story where Hitler Hitler did not, you know, got get power in, 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 in the early 1930s? Yeah, so great question. Um, so, you know, I'm not an expert in Italy. <clears throat> um, I'm never quite sure how much the sort of generalized category of fascism and then we throw Franco and Mussolini under the same hat, whether that really works. Um, but uh, on the second question of leaders, leadership, um, I think there's like a very important dimension, the whole story that's missing uh, that I'm trying to do some work on for some more time now, um, which is what happens in 1933. So of the 8 million people that joined the Nazi party, 7 million join after the Nazis are already in power. So contrary to what people tend to think that there's this set of firebrand extremists that are sort of dying to uh, just seize power and violence. No, the vast majority of Nazis are opportunists. Uh, including my grandfather. Um, they just joined when these guys were already in office and they could see that this is where the tide was going. And that's the thing that they try to serve, okay? Um, and that's not just specific to small people like my grandfather, that's specific to the entire elite. And in some ways, the most striking thing is how quickly these people flip-flop to the winning side, how within six months, a place that's pluralistic and uh, lots of different parties, lots of different newspapers, um, and very vibrant civic society becomes this monolithic one party state in which everybody who wants to get ahead joins the SR and SS and the Nazi party. And they do it to such an extent that the Nazis say, whoa, 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 whoa you better stay outside. We don't want to be overwhelmed by these opportunists. And every time they open, they have this flood of people coming in that they're desperate to stop. And that's what they call it Gleichschaltung in German, which has no real uh, word in, uh, equivalent in, in English. Uh, equalization, meaning making the entire civic society, administration, the courts, the universities, Nazi. And that's all a voluntary act of self-indoctrination or self-professed um, joining the, the winning movement. And 
If that hadn't happened, I think things could have looked very different. But the question is, you know, why does it happen to this extent? And you know, should we think of these people as determined, convinced, um, highly motivated, or should we just think about their career incentives? Should we think about uh, opportunism um, practiced and forgiven in the way that you know you can see in other societies too? Once you have a clear winner. Great. Um, okay. Another follow-up question. Um, okay. So. You mentioned that many anti-Semites hadn't met Jews, um, and you mentioned this in the context of clubs and societies. So was it the case that these clubs and societies, these sort of um, organs of social capital in German society were segregated with respect to Jews? So there's all sorts of segregation. You know, there's the workers cycling club and the upper class riding club and you know, of course people play polo and they're not going to have many <clears throat> Catholics in that. So uh, societies, different clubs and associations create possibilities for people to join in a non-hierarchical setting. That's the Putnam Anglo story, but they also can work to stratify. Um, the, the reason why people have never met Jews isn't that, it's just that they're extremely geographically concentrated and there's not that many. Um, but social, the, the, the social interaction side, I think, can easily polarize and it can easily bring people together. And the way the Germans did it back then, at least provided pathways for contamination. Um, that's, I think, what the evidence seems to suggest. Okay. Uh, we'll have time for a couple more questions. I've got my own question. So what do you think uh, the was the role of... Oh, was there? Sorry, there's. Was the question that was on the left? No, there was on the left. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, thanks so much for that um, extremely, I think, powerful, insightful summary of, of your uh, research on on uh, the origin of, of Nazi extremism. And to condense it, I would say you're saying, well, we've got just extremely persistent origins. We've got this effect of uh, a great financial crisis and then of, let's say, middle class sociability. And would you say this could still be in this very mixture um, the recipe for modern day extremism in a different context, but still this mixture, especially? I mean, we had the financial crisis of 2008, and uh, we do see that uh, a lot of extremist parties, like in Germany, the AFD, uh, etc., do operate in this lower middle class sociability setting. Is this still driving things today? Yeah, that's where I'm sort of wearing too much of a historian's hat. I think, you know, people always want recipes for the day, present day. And of course, as Andrew Oswald rightly said, unhappy people probably are not the best supporters of the existing regime. Now, I think if you sort of look at what the confluence of economic misery in the financial crisis, um, uh, does in Western Europe in the last decade or so, there's one issue that all other parties have neglected and the far right has picked up, which is immigration. And you see it in Brexit, you see it in France, you see it in Germany. There's an issue where, you know, there was basically taboo and independent of what the electorate thought, there was no outlet for them to voice their concerns. And where that coincides with economic concerns, legitimate or not, um, things turn ugly very quickly. That is not an issue in Germany in the same sense. There's some inflow of people from the East after the end of World War I. Some of them are Jewish. Um, some of them are a social problem. You know, uh, Paul Klemperer, for example, um, who writes, was Jewish, a uh, Jewish professor in uh, Dresden, uh, in his diaries writes things that, uh, you know, leading Nazis could also put in their diaries about how awful these people are that come in. Um, but that's not what's driving any of these patterns in the interwar period. Um, but um, I think the important thing, if you sort of look for generalized insights, is that there's this confluence of a way to interpret things that may be subconscious. You get it from other people, you get it from your grandparents, it might be in the newspaper. And then something in your environment makes activates this and makes this sound plausible, or at least less absurd than you used to. And once you see that other people act on this, it becomes respectable. You're no longer being stigmatized for thinking this. And all of a sudden, all sorts of ugliness comes out. So if you actually read the diaries of 
German Jews who thought of themselves as incredibly well integrated. Many of them didn't even think that they were Jews because their grandparents had already converted and they fought for Germany in World War I. And all of a sudden in 1933, their neighbors start to spit at them, um, no longer buying their shops and so forth. And they're completely baffled how this happens. And I think we have to sort of take seriously this possibility and risk of multiple equilibria as a result of social interactions to understand things like this. Okay, I'll, a couple more like technical questions. Okay, uh, <laughs> is the march direction exogenous? Okay, Matt, <laughs> I knew people would laugh at that. Yes, yes, please. Paper, yeah, exactly. Um, been vetted by referees. Just one one question for you, Alvin, and, and maybe you know there's a congress. Uh, a, a question, question for you. Maybe you can hear this better. Um, that's more conceptual, and that that is it. At some level, there are kind of two margins that you study in your work. One is the margin of sort of extreme, hateful, violent, anti-Semitic behavior, and the other margin is is joining the Nazi Party. And and we do tend to conflate. Nazism with you know this extreme violent hateful behavior, um, but it, they, they are two different margins potentially. And and you know in, in your work you kind of explore the different stages of the Nazi Party trying to become a little bit more mainstream and and in you know bringing people in for for fairly mainstream reasons, wanting an effective party um, and and joining the Nazi Party in an anti-establishment sort of way, but not necessarily in an extremist way. And so, you know, I, I wonder, you know, maybe if, if this is something for, for future work, but sort of how these two margins sort of relate to each other. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, you're, very, you're being very polite. You're basically pointing towards what is a hole in uh, the way I've told you the story, which is that these people vote for the Nazi party, or they joined the Nazi party, and they didn't necessarily sort of stand at the gates of Auschwitz uh, selecting people, right? And that is the end point. So, you know, how do we connect these things? Um, and did they approve of this? Well, the Nazis kept it a secret. It was a very open secret. Everybody pretty much knew on the Eastern Front, people were happily standing right by the shooting pits, uh, sending uh, snapshots back home. Um, so what I'm trying to tell you, I think, is that even if they're not directly participating in a leading role without the connivance on the gigantic scale, which I think we only sort of appreciate now, none of these things could have really happened. And it doesn't take, it's not just the person at the gate. This is the sort of big 1940, post 1945 myth of German society that just a handful of evil people in brown uniforms parachuted into Germany, did a bunch of evil things, <coughs> nobody knew, and then they disappeared thanks to the Nuremberg trials. Right. And everything we know is that there's a very broad spectrum and there's basically no opposition and that there's turning away, there's mild support, there's enthusiastic support. Um, and then there's a handful of people who actually do this very actively. Um, and one of the things that at some point in my life I actually wanted to look at more closely is actually what are, who are these people, where do they come from that actually sort of stoke the fires of hell, um, partly in the industrial process, but also and what happens where half of the murders committed in the form of uh, these uh, firing squads that just go from one village to the next and shoot um, uh, men, women, and children uh, behind the advancing German troops. Uh, and uh, you know, this is probably an embarrassing weakness to confess, but uh, getting closer to that and reading some of the historical background basically gave me PTSD, um, metaphorically, of course, but uh, it was just too much. I couldn't cope with it, and I decided not to pursue it. Okay, my last question. Um, okay, so how should we think about the mass media environment in 1930s Germany? So was it a mass media environment characterized by kind of gatekeeping institutions of big newspapers and radio stations? Was it a mass media environment that was char characterized by, let's say, technological changes that Hitler was able to sort of harness? How can we think about that? Yeah, no, fantastic question. Um, you know, uh, I've sort of surveyed my own work. If there's one, if I could pick just one article that I think has generated real insight in this space, it would probably be Maya Adena, Ruben Elikolopov, uh, Katarina Tsurafskaya's paper on radio and, the rise, radio and the rise of the Nazis. And what they show is that during the years in which they're struggling and uh, are not yet in power, Radio is government controlled. And it's with the sort of standard identification terrain following model, whatever. 
negative, meaning all else equal, if you listen to the government message, um, you will vote less Nazi. And once they're in power, this flips. And then the same areas that were fed the anti-Nazi message now become actively more Nazi. And somehow it seems to be the case that keeping them out is more effective than actually propelling them forward, but they only have two months to sort of get going and so forth. But they then, of course, pioneer modern day propaganda. This is where Goebbels puts a lot of his effort. Um, and again, in contrast to what some people think, uh, the most effective and insinuous form of propaganda seems to be entertainment. So it's very much like this paper on Berlusconi trash television in Italy. Uh, the easiest way to corrupt people seems to be just by light entertainment with the occasional sort of uh, politically um, spiced message blended in. Um, but in terms of newspapers, for example, until 1933, there's a very rich fabric of different newspapers. They all declare their political allegiance. You can just look it up and say, okay, this is for the DVP and this is for the SPD and this is a Nazi newspaper. Uh, so that's one of the things that we analyze in the financial crisis paper. Um, uh, so, you know, there's no, there's very little change in tonality. So you can't really do much text analysis because they basically right. just pull the party line at this point. But that would be the principal source of political information for the average German in 1930s Germany. Great. All right. So thanks very much. Bishnu, is it, this is where I hand over to you. Okay. Yeah, so thank you, Joachim, on behalf of CAGE, uh, the Department of Economics and the Economic History Group. I want to thank you for this really insightful lecture on one of the main topics of our time. Um, and it's a fitting tribute to Nick, who's in the audience. So I want to ask Nick if he wants to say a couple of words. Thank you, Vishnu. Yes, um, I think my job is to thank various people, including, of course, you, uh, but uh, especially thanks to Cage, uh, just for the concept of the Crafts Lecture, which I, I must admit I'm honoured by, and of course for organising it this year, and that includes particularly Jane and Kerry. I must thank Mirko for such a generous introduction and exposing my lack of a PhD. That is indeed exactly correct. I don't have one. Unlike most of you, I didn't need one. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you, Arkim. That was genuinely a great lecture. It fully justifies and does the concept proud. Um, wrong language, I know, but it was a tour de force. So thank you, Joachim. So pleased you agreed to do it. And thank you for your, I think I made it 80 slides. That's a lot of effort. <laughs> Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.